1940 presents what is believed to be a television first. In living color, exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. The woman host of a local television broadcast shot herself in the head while the program was on the air. The morning of July 15, 1974, would forever change the lives of Americans. Like any normal day, they turned on their televisions to see 29-year-old Christine Chubbuck on the screen of her Suncoast Digest morning show, broadcast in Sarasota, Florida. However, something different happened. Instead of giving an in-studio interview as usual, the woman began recounting a series of violent news stories that had occurred over the weekend and she would end her report with an account so crude and unexpected that everyone would think it was fake. At that point, I wasn't absolutely sure it was real. Once I saw the movement of her head, I knew it was. Christine would take her own life on the television set. However, prior to her demise, Chubbuck left a series of red flags that everyone missed. Why did she do it on camera? What motivated Christine to want to be seen by all viewers, including her family? Why didn't anyone realize what was about to happen? Christine's final words still echo in the heads of viewers who witnessed the brutal moment. These are the details of her life to try to understand why she decided to spend her last moments in this way, enunciating a heartbreaking monologue. Christine Chubbuck was born in Hudson, Ohio, where she spent her entire childhood and youth. From an early age, she was a self-absorbed child, despite her strong personality. However, Christine was not like other girls. Something dark was growing inside her that didn't allow her to find her place in the world. Most of the time she spent, I think, feeling like she was an outsider. And uh, there were times when she was so moody that you could just tell by looking at her that you'd back off. The most important things to her were her mother and brother, whom she considered her best friends. She spent most of her time with them since she didn't have many friends outside the house. Since she was a little girl, she was very lonely and it was noticeable that something strange was going on with her, something that didn't allow her to be happy. Chris clearly had some depressive issues. My parents took her to psychologists and so forth. Christine had serious self-esteem issues. She felt she didn't fit in and never considered herself good enough at her job. She struggled to have friends and romantic relationships as she reacted in a hostile and defensive manner to compliments and kind gestures. Despite this, Christine went on to study theater at Columbus University. But she was always passionate about communications, so she moved to Massachusetts in 1965 for a major in broadcasting at Boston University. From here, her career as an anchorwoman was on the rise and promised much success. She began working for media outlets in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Ohio until she arrived at the ABC affiliate network WXLT-TV, where at first she only did traffic news in Florida. However, she would end up being one of the channel's most important faces by having a morning talk show about community issues called Suncoast Digest. I remember the first time they brought in Christine Chubbuck. She was hired because she was intelligent, smart, witty, very good writer. At only 29 years old, she was already leading a television show that aired every Sunday morning. Even before her death, she had been promoted to director of public affairs for the television network. However, all these achievements didn't take away the young anchor woman's depression. I think Christine never really had the image of herself that the rest of the world perceived. They perceived her as confident, they perceived her as attractive, they perceived her as gifted at her job. And I don't know that she really perceived herself fully as any of that. Despite being a withdrawn and reclusive person, she was very good at interviewing and volunteered at a hospital in Sarasota, Florida, cheering up children with puppets. There were two sides to her. There was this side that was warm and loving and funny and, and generous and giving, and then there was this other side that was just like this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. These two sides of Christine, one that won the viewers over and the other depressive and disturbing, would be in constant conflict within her. Until the day would come when she could no longer bear this dispute and she would only see a dark scenario in her life that prevented her from continuing to fight for happiness. However, no one would imagine the way she would decide to end her life, nor that she would force everyone to watch her last moments live and direct. However, four years earlier, Christine raised one of many signs. 
The idea of ending her life was a constant thought, and one that she had been planning for a long time. Christine's first attempt to take her own life occurred in 1970, with an overdose of medication. But the family never told the channel about it so that the woman wouldn't be fired. They never imagined she would try again. Then, in 1974, three weeks before the fateful day, she would approach her bosses with a strange proposal. She said, I would like to do a feature on suicide. One of the first places she went was to the sheriff's office. Sheriff's deputies said she had asked me about how someone would commit suicide for a news story. And he told her the bullets that he would use and uh, the type of pistol. On that visit, Christine was told that the main thing people used to take their own lives was a 38 caliber gun and other details about how it would be more effective to end one's life immediately. At the end of the interview, she went to a shop to buy what was recommended to her, where of course, she had no problem acquiring it. When she arrived at the channel, she told a colleague who thought it was a bad joke, part of the young woman's humor, but she wasn't joking. Another time, Christine surprised her colleagues with a comment, another sign of things to come. Eight days before she took her own life, she said the following. She said something to the effect of, wouldn't it be wild if I blew myself away on the air? She herself told her colleagues that she possessed a lethal weapon and how she wanted to carry it out, but no one thought that this was actually going to happen. Sooner than they thought, tragedy struck, for Christine had everything coldly calculated. July 15, 1974, Christine arrived early at the channel and dressed smartly. As soon as she walked in, she asked the director to record the show right away. She was in a much better than normal mood. To this day, her enthusiasm still puzzles me. She told her colleagues that she wanted to start the show with a new summary, something she hadn't done before, but it was still not a fact that aroused more than mere curiosity. Christine sat behind the desk in the studio, stared into the camera, and gave the signal to begin the broadcast. And so began Christine Chubbuck's last words. This weekend, being critical of the recent rash of violence, so one man stabbed, another assaulted, and a third shot and wounded. Sarasota so police report the finding of an 18-year-old, a man by the name of David Wynn, in the parking lot of the Family Tavern on 27th Street. Wynn had an apparent stab wound in the chest, which, according to witnesses, was inflicted by James Whitworth during a fight. Police charged Whitworth with aggravated assault. Wynn is in satisfactory condition at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. The second attempt at armed robbery in a week has involved law enforcement officers from both Sarasota and Manatee counties. Last week, teenage gunmen held up the highway bar and after a shootout and high-speed automobile chase, held a family hostage and finally were nabbed by Sarasota Sheriff's deputies. Early Sunday morning, the Beef and Bottle restaurant north of Sarasota Bradenton Airport on US-41 was the site of an attempted armed robbery and shooting. TV40 newsman Bob Peterson was on the scene shortly after it began and he filed this report. During the first eight minutes of the show, Christine read news stories about acts of violence but as she continued her story, the tape got stuck and could not be played. With all the calmness in the world, the presenter shrugs and continues with her script. Sorry, for those of you who saw late night weekend news watch last night, we did have a film report and a commentary by Bob Peterson. Unfortunately, we had technical difficulties and cannot bring it to you now, however, watch news watch tonight at 5.30 and we'll have that story for you then. As of this morning, Foster, Grace Foster, who was shot in that incident, is in satisfactory condition at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. With a chilling coldness at that moment, Christine reached into her purse, which was under the table, and unsheathed a 38 caliber device, the same one recommended to her by her interviewees. She kept it in her hand under the desk without anyone noticing. In keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first. In living color, exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. Christine shoots herself behind her right ear and falls violently. The show was immediately interrupted by a black screen. 
It was around 9.30 in the morning and viewers began to call the police and the channel to find out if it was a hoax. At that point, I wasn't absolutely sure it was real. Once I saw the movement of her head, I knew it was. Panic began to grip the studio and no one was moving around trying to figure out what had just happened. So I go out to the studio expecting to give her a piece of my mind for such a sick joke and see her laying over in the studio floor with a half side of her head blown off. Everyone was in a state of shock at the same time. We just didn't believe what we were seeing. In the place where Christine was reading, they found a script stained with her remains. There, they realized that she completely planned that day's program, including the moment where she would take her own life. She even placed the subsequent report of her own accident that would later be shown on the news, which ended with her being rushed to the hospital and remained in a critical state of health. Alongside the script was a note, in which she said goodbye to her co-workers and family, but also expressed a macabre wish. She said that she wanted to, to do this and she wanted everybody to see it. As her script told it, Christine was rushed to the hospital, but despite her best efforts, she died 15 hours later. The police confiscated the original videotape for investigation and after closing the case, they handed it over to her relatives. Amidst the consternation, colleagues and family members began to speculate about the reporter's motivations for her unexpected action. The reasons behind her decision are unclear, as Christine never shared this information with anyone. Some colleagues believe that by not having romantic relationships, Christine's state of mind worsened over the years, as she herself commented that she was about to turn 30 years old and still celibate. This adds to the rumor that she was in love with her colleague George Peter Ryan, who was in a relationship with a co-worker, who was also a friend of Christine's. Her family suspects that she was going through a severe crisis due to her depression and that her problems with socializing caused her to live a life that wasn't enough for her to be happy. They also knew of her desire to become a mother at some point, but doctors told her that if she didn't do it soon, it would be impossible since she had to have surgery to remove an ovary and her chances of getting pregnant were drastically reduced. Her family also believes that a major factor in exacerbating her depression was the constant publication of violent news stories. The kind we often see in our televisions today began in the 1970s and Christine lived through that television turnaround. I think that part of television, that salacious part of television, Chris detested. I think she felt that the station emphasized sensationalism over serious journalism. Christine was annoyed by the channel's decision to show the most shocking images possible, loaded with violence in order to boost ratings, what she called blood and guts reporting. And so she decided to give them the most raw news they could ever cover, live in front of the eyes of thousands of viewers and colleagues. Christine was cremated and her ashes were thrown into the Gulf of Mexico. With almost 120 people at her funeral, three of her favorite songs were played. After her extremely mediatic demise, the show continued to air for years, only now with a new host and continuing to cover raw stories, the very stories that Christine so detested and which were the driving force behind the end of her life.